Dr. Garcia, and I'm here to talk about uh, synthetic biology and how we are designing life for a uh, specification. And this has become a little bit of a fashionable topic. You know, all this synthetic biology was on the cover of The Economist, and it's been uh, somewhat fashionable for tech people to invest into, but, you know, the normal people don't know about it. I mean, how many of you have heard of synthetic biology before? Okay, that's like uh, 10 people, they're all right here. <laughs> so they get very um, good. So, um, I'm here to explain you what this is about, and I, I do have my uh, titles and positions, but I'm here, I come here as a nerd, because I, <laughs> I am a nerd, I'm a and I'm a geek, and uh, the reason I wanted to come here is, is one, uh, I always thought it's like, man, if, if I wasn't doing this thing, I, I would like someone to explain it to me, to give me the big picture, because it's, it's fun, it's interesting, it's weird, right? And also because um, it's probably going to change our lives in 10, 20, 50 years, right? And um, that's why I'm here. Um, so let me get you to explain what this synthetic biology or symbio, as we call it, is. First, uh, but you know, first I have to do a disclaimer. These are my opinions only. I worked in Berkeley Lab, and my opinions are mine. They don't uh, represent the Berkeley Lab or the Department of Energy, so don't sue them for that. Just, uh, just uh, trust me, they're just mine. Now, the first thing, uh, what is this synthetic biology thing? And I could give you a very long abstract introduction or definition of it, but I won't because I think this video does a much better job than I do. The bee is an incredible biological machine. This creature's tiny neuron computer makes trillions of calculations as it maneuvers its body with speed and precision. The bee colony is a self-maintaining, self-replicating system programmed to endlessly continue its task of survival. Through our understanding of the DNA code, we are gaining the ability to create new living machines to our design specifications. The natural world is filled with building blocks of the DNA software which combined with engineering will open breathtaking possibilities. Fully unlocking this code will bring us the greatest technological advancement ever known to our civilization. Imagine modifying the DNA code of plants to grow living buildings. We can revolutionize construction, architecture, and gardening, creating entire cities out of living organic material. The most powerful computing system known to us is the brain. Once we become capable of programming and organizing neurons, we can create new supercomputers, dwarfing our current systems in power and efficiency. This paradigm in technology and evolution can expand life's ability to colonize and populate our solar system and beyond. Sending living spaceships and organisms modified and engineered to live in different extraterrestrial environments. This new self-aware and self-guiding evolutionary process can take life to the next level of existence. So this may sound like science fiction, yes. but uh, we've done this before. We bioengineer living beings to our specifications, to our needs. And probably the best example are dogs. For 15,000 to 40,000 years ago, <laughs> a dog decided to come very close to a human. They regretted it. But what we did is we bred them, we found things that we liked in them. They were faithful, they were loyal, loyal, they were helping us out. And we bred them and bred them until we changed how they thought, we changed how they behaved, and we changed how they looked. Sometimes for the better, sometimes not so much. <laughs> but, but we've done it before. It just uh, took uh, tens of thousands of years. And we've done it many other times. These are tomatoes. This is the pop and juicy things we put in our tomato sauces, our pizzas, our gazpachos these days. But uh, this is what they look like uh, 80,000 years ago. First in Ecuador and then in Mexico, 400 centuries ago, we started breeding them, putting them together. This thing had a very mild taste, somewhat sweet, wasn't much of a thing. And now this created what we, what we uh, love uh, and put in our foods everywhere. This is the initial, uh, initial banana. It was mostly seeds, and there wasn't much stuff to eat. 
tens of thousands of years later, by breathing and mixing the varieties that we like best, we have the bananas that we, that we uh, eat every day. Now, um, so we've been bioengineering living beings for tens of thousands of years. What is new now? What is new is that we can now efficiently read and write the code of life, DNA. We probably heard of the uh, genomic revolution. We were able to sequence the human genome. And now we can take almost any cell, and, uh, well, any cell, and, and get the sequence of the DNA. And that has all the coding instructions from that cell. And since the 70s, we're able to write and change the DNA. There's many things that come on this. The latest um, example of that are CRISPR-based gene editing that was created very close to here at UC Berkeley by Nanda and Schumpeter, and makes it incredibly easy to change the DNA of a living being in vivo. So, what do we do with these things now that we don't have to wait tens of thousands of years to change biological beings? A lot. And one example is this, right here in Emmerville, Gold Threads, is using uh, synthetic biology to create a spider cell without having to milk spiders, which is kind of complicated. <laughs> <laughs> what they do is they take the genes that create that silk monomers, they put them in E. coli, and they put them together. And uh, the, uh, Spiber, another company in Korea, has um, coupled with the North Face to create the first spark made of uh, spider silk, synthetic spider silk. These are still only $1,400. You can only find them in Japan, but they will be coming soon to Berkeley, I promise you that. <laughs> This is a classic example of synthetic biology or genetic engineering, like it was called in those times. This, uh, this is the 10,000, 8 to 10,000 pounds of big pancreases you need to create one pound of insulin. Yes, pancreases. You have to take the pig, open it up, get the pancreas out. Not something you want to do at home. <laughs> now we take, what we do is we take the um, genes that create that insulin, put them in coli or yeast, and we grow them like we, uh, like we brew beer. And you can, if you're, in a, um, if you're a diabetic, you can treat your ailment at home at ease. Now, more recent things are uh, the matrix. Um, they are taking the genes that uh, you can find in marijuana, the great THC and cannabis, putting them into yeast and producing this in a high quality, low cost way. And you can use them for uh, medical purposes or other purposes. <laughs> Probably one of the most popular um, or most widely seen uh, applications for synthetic biology are the Impossible Burgers. These are burgers that are mainly completely out of plants, but they taste like meat. Why? Because they were, you know, to their plant uh, material, they add something called heme. The heme is the part of your blood that attaches to oxygen. And what they found is by adding this into your plant material, you can pretty much recover most of the taste of meat. And if you don't believe me or you want to try, you can go just to your next Burger King and try it because this is mass produced nowadays. Another example of synthetic biology is uh, creating hoppy beer without hops. This is uh, Charles Denby that I work uh, with. And what uh, Charles and Rachel did is were able to um, create hoppy beer without hops. To give you an example of how this works, this is how you make beer traditionally. You take your wort, you with your barley, then you add your brewer's yeast and it takes the sugars, makes them into ethanol, and that creates the, the beer that we love. If you wanna uh, add some hops to create this APA taste that uh, uh, many people love, you just add them and that creates that uh, hoppy taste. What we did, what Charles and Rachel did in, in, in our collaboration was to take the genes that create that hoppy flavor and put them in the brewer's yeast. So it was creating both the ethanol and the hoppy flavor at the same time. And if you want to get some of these strains, you can uh, contact them. They're right here, Berkeley Brewing Science. So you can get your own yeast and do your uh, hobby at home without the need of hops. Hmm. Another one is human collagen. Um, human collagen apparently is incredibly good for uh, your, the smoothness of your skin. And uh, as the people in Yelter say, they, it's really not advisable to uh, harvest human collagen. <laughs> <laughs> A body in general. So what they did is they took the genes, they put them in yeast, and they can create them in a vat, just like the brew beer. And uh, imp interestingly enough, they did something very complicated, which is the, to get the support of uh, PATA, PETA. Another application of uh, synthetic biology is disease control. This mosquito here uh, transmits dengue and Zika in Brazil. People in Oxitec in England, they created this gene drive. But they had a particular gene that was completely harmless to female mosquitoes that um, stopped 
uh, male mosquitoes from flying. And then, of course, if you are a mosquito and you don't fly, you get eaten very quickly. So they created a gene drive such that this gene was eventually um, found in all the uh, posterior generations. So all the male mosquitoes were eliminated, and there was only females, and that, of course, destroyed the population. And you could actually uh, see a 81% mos uh, mosquito population reaction, eliminating most of the dengue and Zika uh, spread. Finally, we at Berkeley Lab are trying to use synthetic biology to, uh, to tackle some of the most important problems in, in the world nowadays. And uh, probably number one of them is climate change. So we're trying to do we are trying to produce uh, renewable biofuels with uh, synthetic biology. We take uh, oops, the energy of the sun and the CO2 from the atmosphere, we grow plants with it, then we deconstruct them with something called ionic liquids and enzymes, and then the sugars that come out, that come out of that, we feed them to an engineer cell, E. coli or pseudomonas or yeast or something like that, and we create biofuels. These biofuels you can put in your car or your jet or whatever, and the CO2 that comes out is the same one that came in to create the plant, so it is carbon neutral or almost carbon neutral. Huh. We're also making bioproducts like uh, plastics that are biodegradable. So they disappear within uh, two years instead of 2000 and stay in the ocean forever. Now, bioengineering is not easy. In fact, it is hard. All these examples may make you think, and the video in particular is kind of hype, it makes you think that Ooh, you just have to go and do it. You can do it at home. Not really. It's hard. And to give you an example of, of that, and that it has consequences, you can probably check this uh, article out, but this is a local company that promised um, 9 million liters of biodiesel in 2011 and 15 in 2012, and they failed. And this was their um, valuation in stock options, around 500 at the top, they went all the way to 2.77. Because it's not easy to create these things, and there are economic consequences to that. Now, why isn't it easy? Well, because we can't predict shit, if I may use technical terms. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's the problem we have all the time. We need better predictive power, and, or maybe in more technical words by one of my personal heroes, Tim Garner. Um, our ability to engineer predictable outcomes uh, from biological system remains infantile. We can make the changes we intend in DNA, particularly with CRISPR and Talent and so on, and that's pretty effective, but the effect on the cell biology is generally unexpected. Mm. And that's where uh, my group and my team came in, and we're trying to use um, AIs, artificial intelligence, to capture with synthetic biology to predict what happens when you bioengineer cells. Um, I'll give you just one example. Uh, you can find many more in our website, but um, it's hard, it was hard to choose one example, but I'll give you one that is kind of nerdy. I had an initial one that wasn't nerdy enough, but this one is it's really nerdy. So. <laughs> so there you go, nerdy moment, now. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. So we're using something called autumn colors to design proteins. And proteins are the enzymes, you know, the parts that catalyze every reaction in your body. When you respire, when you create energy, when you digest uh, aliment, um, uh, food, when um, these are the, the proteins that actually make up your bones, your skin, your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your nails, everything. So if you can design proteins to specification, you can do a lot, right? So, and then there is this thing called autoencoders, which has been an interesting uh, uh, device tool in, in machine learning. That what it does pretty much uh, takes, let's say, in this case, a picture. This is a handwritten digit of a two, and this is a picture of that. So um, you put it through an encoder, you get a compressed representation, it loses information, but once you put it through the encoder, you find pretty much the same thing. Not the same thing, but pretty much the same thing. You lost some information here, but it's still pretty much the same thing. You, you keep the most important features. And to give you an example, um, this, there's a library called a list uh, of all handwritten digits, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, by, by 10,000 people, so there's one written by me, by this guy over there, by this girl over there, there's tons of them. And uh, this is what we call the compression representation, which is called the latent space, and each of these points is one of these digits. So this is the two that I wrote, this is the two that he wrote, this is over here is the two that she wrote, all over there. And you can tell that each uh, to each point corresponds one of these digits, and the ones that are nearby are very close. They are very similar, right? And that is all nice and good, but you know, why is this useful to progress? Well, this thing looks like um, handwritten one to me and to you, 
into a machine is just a picture. It's just a sequence of zeros and ones. So one could think, well, maybe the machine cannot tell it's a real image. You know, we can just give it a sequence of something else. Because proteins, all they are is just sequences of amino acids. So we can fit the algorithm uh, sequences of amino acids instead of zeros and ones. And then we would have a latent space where each point would correspond to a different protein, and nearby proteins will be very similar to each other. Okay? So this will give us, this latent space here will give us a description of all proteins that we know. Because we can make a map of all uh, possible proteins. We do this uh, for something called neural networks, and that's when things get uh, geeked out. And uh, neural networks are they are a way to um, to imitate your brain, um, your, uh, your neurons, you know, they have their dendrites and axons, and uh, neural networks are a way to imitate that in a way, in a very, in a very um, not very um, rigorous way, you know, a, a rudimentary way. And they work incredibly well. In the last 10, 20 years, neural networks and convolutional neural networks and the neural networks have become, have uh, created a revolution in machine learning that is leading, you know, self-driving cars, and uh, image recognition, uh, deep fakes, all those things that you see in TV and you get scared about, they've been going with this kind of uh, new networks. <laughs> it is what it is. So what we did is we took those proteins and uh, we fed them into the algorithm and we created a latent space. Over here, you see the latent space of all proteins that we've collected mm. in, in, uh, in human history, that they are in all uniprot. So, each of these points over here, and we can move it around, each of these points is a protein, okay? And nearby proteins are nearby in latent space. For example, all of these proteins are oxidoreductases. They take um, water and they split it into oxygen, okay? So all of these things here are oxidoreductases, but you can see, you know, each of the blue dots here is a protein. They are white spaces, right? Like, you see this white space here? Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. But you can always take that part of latent space and pass it to the decoder, and you get another sequence. And because it's really coupled with uh, the oxidoreductase, you expect that sequence to be an oxidoreductase. Mm -hmm. So you can create new examples of proteins and design them to your specification. You have an oxidoreductase, there you have it. You have a hydrolase, you have an ATPase, you just can go into that part of the latent space. So imagine this is ATPase, you can go here, take this space here, put it to the decoder, you get an ATPase. Same way, you can you want a hydrolase, you can go to this part over here, put it to the color, you get a hydrolase. Oh. And this is something that people have been doing for a long time with images, right? You can take these generative models, as they are called, and you can feed them millions of images of living rooms, millions of them, and they will generate new images of living rooms that never existed. Mm -hmm. This living room never existed. It looks pretty real to me. This one never existed, or this one. And you can do these things with uh, celebrities as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can take a million pictures of celebrities, fit into the algorithm, and create new ones. So these people never existed, but they look pretty celebrity to me. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel like paying money to see a movie by them. <laughs> anyway, they're not perfect, you know, some, sometimes they fuck up, like, really bad. <laughs> But most of the time, like 95% of the time, they are fine. And seriously, this is a field that is just moving fast. Like, like the things that were done like a year ago, are they seem like uh, middle ages compared to what people are doing now with flow-based models and transformers and things like that. So it's been, it's been uh, pretty impressive. Now, what we're doing with that is instead of creating uh, celebrity faces, which are, I guess, interesting but not that useful, um, <laughs> We, uh, we create uh, proteins that have a particular specification. So here we create a hydrolase that uh, splits water, and uh, we create a whole new sequence that then we can, we can order DNA, and we can express, and we can test. And here is a protein that is expected to be in the, in the membrane, and we can, combine, uh, we can combine these things. We can have a hydrolase that is in the membrane, a hydrolase that is in the cytosol, etc., etc., etc. And I won't get into the details of that, but if you want to hear that, uh, you want to read the whole details, we have a paper in the archive mm -hmm. that is called How to Hallucinate um, Functional Proteins. And uh, this new generation of proteins or, or images called hallucinating new uh, 
new uh, proteins, right? Because what you do is you go into latent space and you and you uh, you sample that. Now, I think um, during a very interesting synthetic biology, in a very interesting time in synthetic biology. Sorry, um, synthetic biology could be, and bioengineering could be, like the industrial revolution, changing our lives in a dramatic way. And I think we are right now at the time, um, like 1790, in the industrial revolution. In 1790. We knew that steam could actually automate a lot of our processes and, they, and it could actually make a difference, but it wasn't widespread. You know, people knew it, but it wasn't widespread all over the world. And this is where we are right now with synthetic biology. We definitely can do a lot of things biology, but it's not widespread. Okay? And the Industrial Revolution had a lot of good things. So, uh, you know, before the Industrial Revolution in the Middle Ages, 99% of people were farming, 90% of farming was weeding. And then on Sundays, you got to charge, and that was it. It wasn't particularly fun. So for about 100 people here, 99 of us would be farming and weeding and then going to charge. One of us would be, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, being a priest, doing maybe some music, uh, maybe uh, being, a, uh, being a king, things like that. One of us. Everyone else will be just like, <laughs> Now. 4% of the population is doing farming, the rest of us can do science or, or, or literature or music or whatever we want. So the industrial revolution has some good things to it, right? It also has some bad things, and uh, pollution is definitely one of them. And I come from a city, Bilbao, in the Basque Country, that was definitely very heavily hit by pollution. Now it's, you know, the clean up is pristine, but for the longest time, it really wasn't too good, right? And, uh, you know, if you are from Cleveland, Ohio, you may remember the fire that, uh, the, the river that ignited itself. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So, there's been good things and bad things in the Industrial Revolution, and there will be good things and bad things to synthetic biology. And I don't think it should be left to us scientists to decide what to do and what not to do. I think it should be a conversation that we need to have with society, with people like you, that tell us, you know, what are the risks that are worth doing and what are the things that we can do for society. And that's why I think it's going to be you <laughs> telling us in a conversation, what do you like us to do with this new technology, with these new possibilities? But not just us as scientists, but the people who fund us, which are politicians. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do in order to do that is get informed, get the facts, understand what's going on and why, and then tell politicians and us in a continuous discussion, what are the things you want us to do with synthetic biology and AI for the benefit of society. You can find some information at our webpage, human.ldl.gov. There is a resources part of it where um, you can have some introductory reading about what synthetic biology is. There is a non-technical part, there is a technical part. You can uh, understand what are the possibilities and non-possibilities. You can talk to your representatives, you can talk to scientists too, because uh, Berkeley now, we have things like science at the theater. We bring our scientists out there, I think it's twice a year or once a year. We bring our scientists out there at the Berkeley Theater to tell us what we're doing. And people can ask questions for as long as they want. Like, seriously. So, get involved. Ask questions. Learn more. That will make you more informed. You'll be able to choose better politicians who know what they're doing. That will allow you to tell us what to do and what risks are worth taking or not. Okay? And there is also a Berkeley Lab Community Advisory Group. You can be part of that. Berkeley Lab wants to be a part of community that is uh, creating uh, science that is tackling your problems. It's, it's trying to make science to make society a better place. So tell us, what are you interested in? What, what are you afraid of? We are here to help. So that's what we're trying to do. Please help us. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.